Good morning. It's good to see everyone here. Hopefully we can start <clears throat> uh, heading to your seats. I know we have some other people coming, but uh, try to get started on time here. <clears throat> We have <clears throat> we'll be starting here in just a minute. <laughs> okay, so good to see all of y'all. Uh, we have our usual activities plus um, today uh, we're gonna have a packing party at one. so uh, there, there is a light uh, lunch available afterwards, so you're welcome. Even if you didn't plan to stay, there's, there's plenty of food, so you can stay and, and have a little time of fellowship. The, the, there will be some instructions, and we'll start the packing at, at one, 1 o'clock. But, um, and then if you wanted to go home and, and, and eat lunch and then come back, you can still, still be part of that party. So ho hope to see some of you there. Um, and uh, we'll make an announcement that next week is Daylight Savings Time. So you can be here an hour later. If you come early, there's Sunday school. <laughs> if you don't usually come, you just attend Sunday school. <laughs> so, uh, but anyway, be happy. Anyway, just try to remember that. I'll be reading from uh, Psalm 119. Uh, with the letter Hey, beginning with verse 33. Teach me, O Lord, to follow your decrees, then I will keep them to the end. Give me understanding, and I will keep your law and obey it with all my heart. Direct me in the path of your commands, for there I find delight. Turn my heart toward your statutes and not toward selfish gain. Turn my eyes away from worthless things. Preserve my life according to your word. Fulfill your promise to your servant so that you may be feared. Take away the disgrace I dread, for your laws are good. How I long for your precepts. Preserve my life in your righteousness. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word that you've given us, and we just pray that you'd give us understanding through your spirit to, uh, that we would delight in these things and uh, walk in your ways. Uh, just pray that your word be proclaimed today. Pray that you'd uh, help us to praise you. And uh, uh, just pray that you'd be glorified in all that we say and do. In Jesus' name, amen. <coughs> Good morning. Good morning. Fall has arrived. For a couple of days, anyway. Anyway, feels good out there. Feels good. Feels great up there. A little moisture. What a great rain we had this past week. Over two inches. Some people got more. I know, pray for the people in East Texas. I think they had anywhere from 12 to 20 inches in places. The, some of the rivers were out of the banks over the major highways, even. So <clears throat> we are thankful. We needed it. Well, okay, so first thing, I'm kind of stopped up and everything like everybody else is and Rob and like that. So if I start coughing, just keep singing. <laughs> okay, all right, we're going to stand sing. We're going to start off with the beauty of your grace. Everybody stand.
be the name.
Come Thou Found. Father, we thank you so much that your grace is always with us. We have
have an awesome God that desires that relationship with us. We're so thankful, Lord, for your son Jesus that died upon that cross, that rose on the third day, ascended into heaven, sits by your right hand, interceding for us each and every day. We're just so thankful that you have a plan, Lord, and it will come true. No matter what man tries to do, your plan will come true. And we just are so excited, and we know who the victor is in the end. We thank you, and we love you in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. Take your scripture, if you would, and go to the epistle of Jude. Uh, we will, for the next few Sundays, be in uh, Jude. I'm going to tell you the rhythm of this time uh, in this holiday season, or this season that kind of gets interrupted with um, a couple of good things, Thanksgiving and Christmas. I'm not... In any way saying that's a bad thing, so please don't go home and say Rob Santi, Thanksgiving and Christmas, because I'm not. But I do want to, on those occasions, preach some topical sermons around uh, the believer Thanksgiving and celebration of who Christ is, and I want to spend some time during the Christmas season of celebrating the birth, the incarnation of Jesus Christ, all man, all God. And so we want to take some time out, I... I uh, want to look at this book uh, it don't, won't take us long to get through it and so during those between times that's kind of where we're going to be is in the book of Jude and you go oh that's kind of a hard book and it is uh, kind of a hard book but nonetheless uh, I think it would be very appropriate for us to study this book and then sometime early uh, January of next year I want to go to the Old Testament and we're going to be going through the life and times of the lessons learned uh, through the person Jonah and so if you want to even start now reading through that uh, small book, we want to just pick from that God's uh, treasure to us in the Old Testament. When I was 19, I preached my first sermon shortly after uh, I become a Christian and had no business doing that, by the way, so please don't judge me. <laughs> and it was nine minutes long. And my mom called me a couple of months ago. They follow us and they listen to the sermons. They labor through them and I'm their son. They have to love me. <laughs> she says, hey, have you ever preached a nine-minute sermon since that first sermon? <laughs> As a matter of fact, I have not. But if you want to put a watch on me today, I might preach a nine-minute sermon today. I feel terrible. And so we're going to look at this passage together as an introduction and I want you to know that Ken gets to opt out. If he goes into a coughing fit, you guys can carry on with singing. If I go into a coughing fit, we've got to go back to the first century church and somebody's going to stand up and share a passage and then another a testimony and then another is going to speak in a tongue and somebody else is going to interpret. We're just going to have the whole first century church. Uh, and I'm going to slip out the side. I'm not trying to be rude or whatever when the service is over but probably won't shake a lot of hands or hug a lot of necks because I'm not sure what I have but whatever I have I've got all of it. <laughs> Jude's an interesting little book because right off the bat he is in it kind of following his introduction he begins to tell us what he would have preferred to write to the church about and then kind of in the middle of that he says but you know, I thought it right, or I, I was really impressed upon writing in a different way. And so what you see after that is what Jude pins as a necessary for the church to be encouraged and to be warned. It's a book of warnings. It starts with some very encouraging words. I believe that the audience is primarily Jewish believers. I don't think that the Gentiles are excluded from this book, and so you don't have to get up and leave at this point. I do believe that it is an application for us also. But I believe his audience was primarily for those who understood the, his, the history of, of the Jews. They understood some particulars about Judaism because he just uses example after example after example of really the process and the historical value of Christ amongst the Jews how judgment and warning and really blessing and thanksgiving all were a part of their journey and their walk and so he goes back to a lot of Old Testament accounts and he just gives us one account after another most theologians is, and I believe this also that this Jude is in scripture 
a half-brother of Jesus and James's full brother. And I believe we're going to see that in verse 1. But something happened in the transition of where Jude was at at this point and where he was at when Jesus was in the family kind of operating in the dynamic of that whole And so I want to take you to just a few passages of Scripture that shows that prior Jude and then the celebration of the moment that we're going to see in the first few verses of what God did in the life of Jude. If you just take your Scripture and go back to Matthew in chapter 13 uh, rather quickly, I'm not going to labor this point, but I think it's one that uh, really needs to be made that Jude is going to celebrate Christ in salvation in the very first verse. And he's going to do it through the lens of slavery. But he's going to contribute nothing to his own story save Jesus Christ and the grace of God in his life. Because this is where Jude used to be as a brother of Christ. In 1355... Pick up the story with me. Jesus revisits Nazareth. I'm not going to read the whole, and I know I'm breaking into the the middle of a context, but if you will just set your eyes on 53, we'll set it up to get us to 55. And it came about then when Jesus had finished these parables, he departed from there, and coming to his own town, he began teaching them in their synagogue, so that they became astonished and said, where did this man get this wisdom and these miraculous powers? Okay, they know him in a different context, but man, when he comes home in ministry, he's amazing at what he is saying and doing. Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas, which would be Jude? Then look at the very next verse. And his sisters, are they not all with us? Where then did this man get all these things? Jude would have been in that council of the gathering on that day. I know Jesus as my half-brother, I see what he is doing with his life. I watched him grow up in sinless perfection, but yet he did not believe. Go to John chapter 7. Another account when we see the unbelief of the brothers. Beginning in verse 3, his brothers therefore said to him, Depart from here and go into Judea, that your disciples also may behold your works which you are doing. For no one does anything in secret when he himself seeks to be known publicly. If you do these things yourself to the world, not even his brothers were believing in him. How do we in just a few years see the ministry of Christ and the brothers of the household of Joseph and Mary not in belief that Jesus is the Messiah and then we have an epistle at some time between 60 and 80 AD that celebrates the salvation in Christ Jesus. Guys, that's the miracle of this book. That Jude was an unbeliever as well as James, his brother. And you guys just went through the journey in the book of James. What's the very first thing that James says about himself? The very thing that Jude says about himself? A bondservant of Christ Jesus. Not just frolicking through life as he used to, looking and admiring the teachings of his brother and admiring the duties of the uh, the expectation of the miracles of the parables that were being put forth, but he believed Jesus as the Messiah. We know that Paul writes to the church at Corinth and we know that we have a celebration moment in James' life because Jesus met with James and he was born again after the resurrection. Well, I believe at some time in that time frame, so was Jude. You say, well, where do you get that? Go to Acts chapter 1. 
Because I don't, I don't want us to miss this. Because this is a beautiful dialogue of where we're going this morning. And I'm so sorry that I don't feel well, but uh, I get fired up when I see God's celebration in his grace. I want you to begin in verse 12, and it's the upper room uh, account. Jesus has ascended with promise of return, and that promise of return is then followed by a gathering of over 100 believers awaiting the coming of the power of the Holy Spirit. And the scripture says this, beginning in 15, no, in 12. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying, that is, and there's a roll call of significant people, not everybody, but there's some significant people in that upper room. Peter, John, James, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, Simon the zealot, Judas the son of James, different, different Jew, different Judas, but listen to this. These all with one mind. We go from unbelieving to believing in unity with Christ. Continually devoting themselves to prayer along with who? The woman, Mary the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. Can you imagine that moment? I saw, I experienced, I tasted, and by faith I believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the chosen one of God. And he looks at the church in Jerusalem primarily, I believe, and he sees we got a problem. And he loves them so much because he loves God. And God has so impacted his life. And being a born again child of God, a recipient of God's amazing grace, he really wants to talk to him about an issue that is completely celebratory. But he thinks it's better that he warns them because he loves them that much. Now folks, I've studied through Jude several times and I'm sure you have too. You can either approach this book as negative and heavy and you will almost be burdened by it. Or you can look at it, I believe, with the intent. A friend of mine this week, uh, I don't know if you guys know Justin Peters, but if you haven't, you ought to Google him. He's worth the listen. He was texting me back and forth about some stuff uh, that was put out by Benny Hinn. And so we were going back and forth. And he's an apologist, by the way, and very sound. And we were just talking about Israel and some different things. And it was really good to engage again. And he leaves the conversation with this question. And it really hit me hard. I'll just tell you that. He says, Rob, as a pastor or one of the, the elder shepherds at the church there in Ballinger, what are you doing to prepare the church for the coming day of the Lord? In the chaos and the turmoil, what are you doing to equip the saints to meet the Lord on that day? Is it fearful? Is it chaotic? Or are we fixed in Christ and we have an understanding that he's sovereign? Jude's going to address some issues that are going to be very heavy. And it's going to take us back in history to some failures in the, really the people of Israel. And it can be very damaging if you're not careful and you don't frame it right. But it can be a place of great confidence that God has never forsaken his children. He won't leave us. He won't forget us. Guys, I get so irritated when those bumper stickers go by my car and it says, I found Jesus. Folks, Jesus was never lost to be found. He knew always where he was at. And he knew pre-foundationally where I was at. And by his good grace, I stand today as a child of the King. 
Jude, the half-brother of Jesus and the full brother of James. And this is how the book starts. But he's going to make a statement about his position. And it's a position of tremendous humility. Man, if you just wanted to pick one characteristic of Jude, I would have to say a humble servant. Who would start here? I'm telling you where most Western world preachers would start if they were the half-brother of Jesus. Rob, the half-brother of Jesus Christ. My mother was the chosen Mary. Wouldn't we? Nowhere in this epistle do we even find that reference. Because he's bent to knee to the lordship of Jesus Christ and he sees that outside of that, his family economy of being a half-blood brother to Jesus is for naught if he dies in his sin. Only Christ could bring life. And he says, Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, please don't don't brush over that. Please don't try to, to... to bypass that and say, well, a bondservant means that he chose it sometime in the past to, to submit himself. Folks, the word does not give us credence to that. That's not how the word doulos is in scripture defined. He is a slave of Jesus Christ and he does not kick against that. He looks at his life and the sum total of who he is And he says, listen, the first watermark that I want you to to see of great significance in the lordship of Jesus Christ, I know who my master is. And I'm not gonna declare to you that I'm half a brother of his. I'm gonna tell you that I'm James' brother. But I'm gonna tell you first and foremost, I'm a slave of God. Folks, Jesus taught about this, did he not? When we were going through Sermon on the Mount, and I, I just want to tell you, I try to pick passages where we've at least treaded lightly, if not pretty fully. I want you to go back to Matthew, Sermon on the Mount, in, in chapter 6 and verse 24. What a beautiful passage of Scripture. Before we go into the, the cure for anxiety, there's almost like a pause in the game. Did you know that this very word, doulos or slave, Everybody on this earth is a slave to one of two masters. You say, well, I'm not a slave to anybody. Oh, I pray that you're a slave of Jesus Christ. That should not be stiff-armed. Because if not Christ, then Satan is your father. And Jesus made this clear in Sermon on the Mount. In 24, he says, no one can serve two masters. That is, in the original writing, you're going to serve one of two masters, but you can't serve them both. It does not say, if you serve, you'll serve one. He says, no one can. Therefore, it is significant that we see you are under, in slavery, a master. He says, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or... He will hold to the one and despise the other. And then he leaves this little piece of caveat at the end. You cannot serve God in mammon. You know what Jude says in the beginning of his epistle? Jude, a slave of Jesus Christ, I serve the risen king. Neither am I ashamed of it or do I make claim in it that it was because I was merited. I'm falling on the grace of God in Christ Jesus. He said, Rob, where? Well, you're going to see that. I want to show you three characteristics of being a bondservant of Jesus Christ to being born again. It's in this passage. He says, Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ and brother of James. And then he says, called, beloved, and kept man if there was ever a time the church needed to hear something to celebrate my dear friends this is what we need to be celebrating every single day every moment you see that little word it says in the middle of verse one 
to those who are called. I'm going to turn my attention to the body of Christ. Those who under the lordship of Jesus Christ are slaves of the King, the God Almighty of Scripture. And I'm going to tell you how you arrived where you arrived. You arrived on the effectual call of a loving Father. Would Paul not say this? We boast in no one, not ourselves, not the economy of religiosity, not in the keeping of the law. We boast in Christ, in him crucified. Folks, that's the gospel in a nutshell. Who am I outside of Christ? I am nothing. But in Christ, all things are possible in him. And this is where Jude starts. He says, look, I'm a bondservant of Jesus Christ. And here by definition, here's what it is in part, but makes the whole of who I am as a slave of God. I'm called by God to salvation. Well, go with me then, if you will, to Revelation. I want to show you that this is synonymous. This word called in the original text is kletos. And I, 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 again, I only tell you these things not to impress you that I read a Greek or a Hebrew dictionary. It's that you can check this out for yourself. You be a good Berean. You be noble in your, in your understanding of Scripture. I never want you to leave here going... Well, I think Rob pulled a fast one on us. And he wouldn't even tell us where that, where that word was at or what that really meant. I think he's just trying to trick us. No, 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 no. Full disclosure. The called of God, kletos of God. In this, we see words that are synonymous with this. Election, choosing, calling the faithful. They're all rooted in this same thinking. Well, John in the Revelation does something really cool. He takes three of these of understanding of the call of God and he puts them into one verse and he uses all three words. I want you to go to Revelation, if you would, 17. It's the very next book, so we're not gonna have to journey far, but I'll give you time to get there. In 17, 14, John in the Revelation is talking about the victory for the lamb. But look at 14 with me. Remember, we're looking at Kletos, chosen of God. These will wage war against the Lamb. And the Lamb will overcome them. Because He is the Lord of lords and the King of kings. Guys, there's no one like our God. Don't don't fear one thing about what's happening in the Middle East. At one, one bat of the eye, He'll blow that thing up. And he'll put his foot right in the throat of the enemy. Trust him. But listen to this. And those, he's going to give us an audience for this great celebration of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And those who are with him are called. Are what? Are the called, definite article, and chosen, and faithful. Folks, people are always saying to me, now Rob, I, I, I don't really understand the chaos and, and, and I'm kind of concerned this lady at work comes to me and she's just in a panic. I, I just want to make sure that on that day that, that I, I'm not left behind and, and that, that I, I, I'm not outside of the commonwealth of God's grace and I just want to be known as, as, as a child of God. Folks, the chosen, the called of God will be faithful to the end because it's not your faithfulness that will see you to a persevering good end. It's the faithfulness of Jesus Christ in the believer. Jude looks at this church who desperately needs to hear the warnings but the celebration of who they are. The reason he starts with the root because if you're not rooted in Christ, you bear no fruit. No fruit comes from a tree that's not rooted in Christ. And he looks at this and he says, you are called, you are chosen, you are faithful. That's John's description. Jude says you're called, you're beloved, and you're kept. It doesn't matter how you attack this. As a bondservant of Jesus Christ, in the sovereign will of God, you can trust him for whatever your day may bring you. The very first thing, he's called it the call. I, I just want to tell you, uh, when I began to, again, journey through Scripture and just use this word kletos over and over, it's to be called or to be summonsed. 
as a welcome invited guest into a banquet or a specific event. In the word picture of scripture, it's used three ways. And I'm not gonna take the time this morning because we're gonna see it again and we're gonna get to break it out in other passages in Jude. But if you're taking notes, a word picture, you see the summons or the calling of God in three different ways. Man is summoned unto God to an office of responsibility. Guys, this is not some passive call. This is an effectual call. This is a specific call. This is not a common grace. This is a specific grace. And guys, there are two different words in the scripture for that. There is a common grace that falls upon all men. I've told you this already, but I have a neighbor who is lost and he believes not in the the biblical Jesus Christ, he believes in a pseudo Christ. Very religious, but he's not born again. I stood on my porch again this week while it was raining. It rained on my house and it rained on his house too. His lawn is beautiful green. So is mine, by the way. Little fertilizer, a little godly rain, man, it just pops it. That's a common grace. That's common to all men. That's not this call. This is specific. And the first thing we see in a word picture it is really a summons to, a, to an office or a duty, a responsibility. And in this case, service to Christ. Can I just tell you that a bond servant didn't have his own will didn't claim his own possessions, didn't dictate his own time. He was completely submitted to the master. Whatever the master willed, that's what he determined to do. Is this not the example that Jesus left for us? The things that I do, I do for who? You, Father, you sent me. I will do the will of the Father who sent me. Folks, he, in a way, in the incarnation, robing himself in humanity, he subjected himself to these kinds of examples that we might learn from them. And Jude says, look, as a bondservant, as a slave, I just want to tell you, I've been summonsed to an appointment, to an office, and I celebrate being a child of the king. And I want to be responsible for that calling. I will in faith obey his word. Secondly, not only is it a summons to an office. Well, I surpassed my nine minutes so you guys can all relax. (coughs) It's a summons to, to a feast or to a banquet of celebration. Guys, one day the church will be seated around a banquet table in celebration of Christ. And as the bride of Christ, we will enter t- into his presence with not a single wrinkle on our gown. Oh man, guys, I, we only have uh, with us, other than Zoe, w- one other girl in our family, Bree as really she's ours now I'll just tell you and I remember the painstaking measures we went to to make sure her gown didn't have a spot a blemish or a wrinkle I mean you would have thought that was the finest thing in the world we're carrying it like it's precious gold (laughs) and it has this drape in its covering we can't take it out until we get it hung in a place that doesn't have a bunch of dust and stuff No one can see it until we're ready to don it on that day. Guys, one of these days, you and I as believers are going to be summoned to a banquet. We're going to put our feet under the feet of the Lord. And we will be presented as the bride of Christ. And he with us in eternity will live forever. A summons to an office. A summons or an invitation to a banquet or celebration. But my dear friends, it's also a summons to judgment. The writer of Hebrews says something really interesting. It is appointed unto man once to die, 
and then the judgment. Guess what that word appointment finds its root in? Kletos, a call to be summonsed. Can I just tell you as a believer, you don't have to fear that day. You will not stand before God and you will not hear these words. This has been taught to us in religiosity that has no foundation in scripture. When God asks you why you're here, what are you going to say? That is not scriptural. I will say nothing. Neither will you. There will be one that will stand in my place as my advocate. The one who summons me to be a bond servant of his most high position. He will say, Father, you gave him to me. I kept him for this day. An office, a banquet, a judgment of peace. Well, he says, I'm called. And then he says something really that is, just blows my mind. The very next thing, he says, beloved in God the Father, in God the Father, not from him, but in him. I'm beloved by God. That affection was set toward me long before one foundational stone was laid. He said, okay, go to Ephesians chapter 1. I know we go here often, but it's the clearest explanation for this point. Ephesians in chapter 1, I want to begin with you in verse 3. And read down through verse 6. Well, how did all this start? When did all this beloved of God... That self-sacrificial love that we saw at at Calvary. That permanent object of God's affection toward us. Beginning in verse 3 of Ephesians 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's a celebration moment right there. Who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. In who? Christ. Just as he, oh man, here we go. Chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy, blameless before him in love. He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself according to the kind intention of his will. Now look at six. To the praise of the glory of his grace. So who am I going to praise in? Him. Which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved That should be a capital B. That not only talks about the love of God and the affection that God shows toward his children, it's in God. It's not just love like like I am so limited at times even in loving my own wife or my own children because there's such a blemish in my flesh still. And I want to so desperately love them like Christ loved the church and gave himself for her, but I find myself at times neglecting and being harmful. That's not this case. Jude says, though I'm frail, and I'm merely a bondservant, I'm a slave, I'm a doulos of Jesus Christ, I want to tell you who he is in my life. He called me with an effectual call. He fixed me in the beloved of God. He sacrificially showed his love toward me in that while I was yet a sinner, Christ died for me. (laughs) I'm beloved of God. And I deserve none of it. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. I'm loved by God the King. Folks, I don't care what happens to you when you walk out of here. You can go to the bank on that one. That's sure gospel truth. Well, I want you to go to... (coughs) Wow. I wasn't going to do this, but I think it's John 17... Man, if I'm wrong on this one, I'm going to fake a coughing spell. (laughs) I want to begin. I need to get in the right book, I guess. I know it's not going to be an axe. That would for sure would cause a coughing spell. Yeah, it is. All right, high priestly prayer. I want you to drop down to verse 22. future glory John 17 22 
And the glory which thou hast given me, I have given to them. God, oh, I didn't deserve any of this. Thou, that they may be one, just as we are one. Look at 23. I and them, and thou and me, that they may be perfected in unity. That the world may know that thou didst send me and didst love them, even as thou didst love me. How much did God love you? Enough to send his unique son to save you. And as surely as he and his father are in a love relationship with each other, bound in love, so are we in Christ Jesus to the Father. Get this notion out of your head that you're hanging on to Jesus' little finger. My dear friends, you let go and fall. He's got you so wrapped up. You don't have to worry about holding him. He's got you. You think for one minute when we were crossing a busy street when my boys were little or Zoe was young that I would trust them to hold my hand? You know what I was really telling them? Give me your hand. I'm holding you. <laughs> we're going to cross this busy street together. But you don't have to worry about making it. I got gotcha. you. And when difficult times came, I carried them. I didn't even trust their ability to walk. Don't think for one minute that whatever you're going through, God does not carry us in love to the Father one day. He says, well, you're called. You're beloved. That is agape or agape love, a self-sacrificial, a unconditional love that looks like Calvary. But then he uses this little word, look at it with me, and kept for Jesus Christ. Who am I kept for? To go right to the throne. Not almost there. Not kind of, sort of. Not a horizon vision. I'm going right to the presence of my Savior. My Master Jesus Christ. Why? Because he's going to keep me to the end. That word is tereo. And really it is a military word to be guarded or to be under the warden's care. It's to give attention to or to keep an eye on. I remember my parents, we lived way out in the country and sometimes we wouldn't all load up to go to town to, to, to run an errand or whatever because it's 15 miles one way and my mom, as my older brother and I got a little older, they would say this to us as they were leaving. <clears throat> Watch after your two younger brothers, we're going to town. Okay, that meant that when they got back they needed to both be alive. They needed to be in similar condition as when they left. Jesus has gone to his father. And he's seated at the right hand of the throne most holy. He left within us the third person of the Trinity to engage in a keeping ordinance. And he said, it's necessary that I go, but I wouldn't dare go if I didn't leave one just like me. And the work of the Spirit guards my heart and keeps me for the day of celebration. Folks, it's not you holding God. It's God clutching you with his perfected love and mercy. And Jude says, look, I'm a slave of Jesus Christ. Oh, you may know my brother James. Yeah, same family. I'm called, I'm beloved, and I'm kept. And I want you to see what then Jude prays for the believer. He does not pray for addition. This is key. You math teachers can perk up at this point. He does not pray for celebration points of God's grace to his people. In addition, he prays in multiplication of the goodness of God. That's a whole different animal. That's big. Verse 2. May. God, would you grant this? God, would you hear my cry? I can't do this, but I know you can, and you will. I'm asking you, I'm beseeching you, 
may. Mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Mercy. Fathuno, the fullness, the growth, the increase. Knowing what I deserve. He not only saves me from it, but he does not let me experience what I deserve. He keeps me from that. He says, would you multiply mercy in their life? How about peace, Irene? Would you take that position, Father, and multiply something in their life? They were once enemies. They were outside of the commonwealth of your grace. But because of God's great work at Calvary and sealed in the resurrection of an empty tomb three days later, would, would you just grant something to them? Not only mercy, would you just give them in multiple doses your peace? Man, if the church needs to hear anything, we need to hear this. And the peace is not around a table of negotiation. It is in the perfect will of God. And then he says, would you multiply love to them? Would you just lavish them in your love? Would you just show them that unconditional love, that sacrificial love? Would you just constantly remind them they are loved by you and nothing can separate us from the love of God? Nothing. In this small portion of Scripture, I want to show you the purpose statements and I want to give you the why. I think it's important. And then we're going to close. Look at verse 3. He said, beloved, that's a term of endearment, being birthed from the same Father, God himself, through Jesus Christ, through the draw of the Spirit. Beloved, while I was making every effort to write to you about our common salvation, man, I just wanted to write a letter to you guys about God's salvation. And he opens with that, but he says, I'm going to have to take out of a station break here for a minute. There's something more pressing. He says, I wanted to write about a common salvation. I felt the necessity to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to to the saints. And he says, this is why. This is the purpose. Why? For. That little word tells us that. What's the purpose? For. Certain persons have crept in unnoticed. Those who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation. Ungodly persons who turn the grace of our God into licentiousness. And deny our only master and Lord. Jesus Christ. Man, I wanted to come to you guys and just write to you about celebrating Christ and salvation. I'm going to start that way. Because I think you need to be rooted in that confidence in Christ. But I'm going to have to put that little celebration of the common salvation that we have, though we do have it. He's not questioning that. He calls them beloved. But I'm going to tell you about some people that are in your church that are unaware to you. And they are demanding of you a change in the way you think about Jesus Christ and I don't want you to go there folks how much did you love the church how much do we love each other do we love each other enough that we would say hey this is wrong thus saith the Lord that's the rest of the epistle What you see and what you hear from these who have been marked out is not the God of the Bible. Forewarning, live in slavery to Jesus Christ, your Lord. Father, I thank you for this day and the celebration moments that we see. And I just thank you, Father, that you have in every way provided for us in all things and salvation that we live with confidence that you who called us will see us through to the end Father for this time together as the body teach us guide us into all truth through the work of the spirit we'll be quick to give you the praise in all that you do in the high name of Jesus Christ we offer this prayer Amen
job. Made it through. One more song. Let's see what. <laughs> All right. Thank you. That, that big long sermon there. I don't think he went. Oh, yeah, like thirty minutes. <laughs> I knew he wouldn't do a nine minute. <laughs> I knew. I think we all knew that. <laughs> up there, he gets too. He 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 gets too excited. Up there. All right, we're gonna end up with uh, "You Are God Alone." Let's stand and sing. <clears throat>
when we got to see just a snippet of an introduction to a beautiful little epistle, a charge to the church, a warning to those who really are in authority, and we're going to see that, that we guard ourselves against these false teachers. But we want to catch us unaware to cause great damage to the core, the very value of who we are. Father, having been warned, in obedience, place in faith in Christ alone, that we would clearly discern. Yet. Not yet. Oh. Not so fast. <laughs> Linda. Здравствуйте, Grace Fellowship. My name is Vladimir, and I am a shoebox recipient from Kiev, Ukraine. I received one of these beautiful and colorful shoeboxes from Samaritan's Purse Operation Christmas Child when I was only nine years old. And what a blessing this gift was, not only for myself, but also for the whole family. And for me, it was extra special because this was my first Christmas gift ever, and the gospel came with it. But it wouldn't be possible if it weren't for the wonderful, hardworking people like you. And so today, I would just like to share my testimony with you in hopes that perhaps it would it would encourage you to pack as many shoe boxes as you can so you meet your goal of 500 shoe boxes for 2023. And let me tell you, these shoe boxes, they're, they're more than just gifts. They're gospel opportunities. You see, when children receive one of these beautiful shoe boxes, they don't just get a gift filled with new toys, school supplies, and hygiene items, which is awesome. But most importantly, children are introduced to the best gift giver, to Jesus. After children receive their shoe boxes, they're then invited to come and participate in a 12-lesson discipleship program called The Greatest Journey where children learn more about who Jesus is, how to have a relationship with Jesus, and most importantly, how to share Jesus with others. So it's all about evangelism, discipleship, and multiplication. Again, these shoe boxes, they're gospel opportunities. And when I was nine years old, I received one of these beautiful shoe boxes, and I come from a family of nine children. My father was an underground pastor in Kiev, Ukraine. My father risked his life preaching the gospel in the streets of Kiev, Ukraine, at the time when it wasn't popular or loud. And because my father was a believer living in a communist country, he was hindered from advancing in our society. So my father had to settle for low paying jobs. And every time he was captured and written up, it greatly affected his pay even more. So it got to the point to where we had to take turns to go outside to play because we didn't have enough shoes for everybody in the family. We also had to share our toothbrushes and we didn't have access to a lot of new toys, but it didn't stop us from making our own toys. We made yo-yos out of Coca-Cola caps. We played with our shoes, pretending they were cars. And as for food, we pretty much grew up on rice and potatoes, which I often jokingly say that we were vegetarians before it was even cool or popular. And we grew up in a tiny three-bedroom apartment with barely any heating or cooling. So we grew up very poor on the inside of the apartment, heavily persecuted on the outside. But in the middle of all that, we were invited to come to a Christmas celebration. This was in the middle of cold Ukrainian winter. We had to hop on the bus and then on a tram just to get to this place. But when we walked into this place, it's like we transitioned from this black and white cold Ukrainian winter to a colorful room of joy and laughter. There was so much happy music, beautiful, welcoming smiles. But most importantly, they presented the gospel to us in so many different and unique ways through singing, dancing, cartoons, movies, animations, flannel boards. It's like the gospel came alive. And then at the very, very end, they brought out these beautiful and colorful shoe boxes. And when I opened my shoe box, it's like everything that I imagined playing with as a child. It's like it manifested inside of a shoe box. I had my own yo-yo and I have to make yo-yos out of Coca-Cola caps anymore. I have my own toothbrush and I have to share a toothbrush with anybody. And my toothbrush was like a rock star toothbrush. It was like the one to rule them all. It had so much color, so much personality, the way it was designed. It was just beautiful. I also had my own hot oil cars. I have to play with my shoes, pretending they were cars. And again, the cars, they were so beautiful, so colorful. It, it was beautiful. It was awesome. And I also had this 
bar of soap that was like the whitest one, uh, uh, the whitest white I've ever seen. It was so squeaky clean, so slick, so smooth, and a print of the dove on top. It sanctified my, my whole shoebox because the whole shoebox smelled so squeaky clean. And I also had this dental floss that I, I call, uh, that I thought it was, was candy. I looked at thinking it was candy. I remember thinking some really interesting candy that you guys have in America. But you know, most importantly, I felt loved. And I always say that God is love. When you show love to people, you show God to people. When people experience love, they experience God. And once you experience that God's unconditional love, you will not walk away unchanged. And that's what you get to be a part of when you pack a shoebox with Samaritan's Purse Operation Christmas Child. And I am just so honored and blessed to serve alongside of you, Grace Fellowship. Let me tell you what an honor it is. May God bless you all. Bye-bye.